very good ones. And they, you don't lose them and they don't start, start sleeping. And the, the ones who are not very good still follow you. I'm trying to do that. So if I see some people sleeping, I know that I'm doing something wrong. Anyway, having said that, um, this it's really a pleasure for me to be here uh, seriously now. And uh, this is really a collaborative work between ourselves at Harriet Watt uh, and uh, uh, a university, university of Bari in Italy. Uh, and uh, my student, Ilaria Rucco, is not here. Uh, she's a volcanologist. And this is the first time that I got involved in doing this work in, the, in, this, in this arena. Uh, I have been working with uh, um, materials that are of interest to chemical engineering and mainly fluid catalytic cracking or other kind of particles of that size. Anyway, um, doesn't go on. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so what we want to study is volcanoclastic debris. And uh, um, now, I don't know how to point it, but if you see at this, uh, you see this area here, which is, uh, this is the Bay of Naples. In the Bay of Naples, there are two very interesting things. There is the Somma Vesuvius, which is a volcano, and there is a, a fel um, Felegran fields, I have to try to this is in English because I'm used to say this in Italian, which are a volcano, but it's a different kind of, it's, the two are not related. So it's a very volcanic area. And the other interesting thing is that if you see all the mountains on the, on the right hand side there, they are the Apennines, which are in the middle of the city. I was born actually in a place in that mounds there, so uh, 70 miles away from Naples. And one of the bad things is that when there were the, the eruptions, the, the volcanoes deposit a lot of materials on these hills. And now what you get when you have very torrential rains, and you, I know probably that you are aware what's going on in Italy at this particular time, this kind of materials which has been deposited there start to flow. And then uh, it's very, very dangerous. It's very dangerous because there have been casualties in the past, but also from an engineering point of view, we want really to find out how they move, how fast they move, because we want to have a plan in place to tell people when they have to evacuate. So this is the interest uh, that we have in this area. This, is, this st stuff still is not working properly. I, I, I don't know, I mean, yeah. And, and this is what happened after torrential rain in Italy. So this is, this is a, very, a very serious problem. Okay, now uh, this is the quarry where we get our material from. And you can see the scale of time there. It's really, uh, it covers the last 4,500 years. And uh, when you see the little, the little um, um, uh, circle, the red one, that is the material from which we take, it's that material that we analyze. So it's material that was deposited in the eruption of in uh, for, um, uh, AD 472. And it's very interesting because if you look at the picture, I would like to have a pointer actually, but if you look at the picture there, you can see that, you know, uh, there is there, there is actually the, the area where the Romans used to 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 um, use this the soil just to have to grow crops and then there is the eruption and you can see all the stratification of the 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 the, 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 the rocks and uh, my students has access to that quarry we go there and we collect material from there uh, and that is what we analyze. Okay, now. Um, why uh, these materials are very peculiar? Uh, they are peculiar because depending, as you probably know, the kind of flow that you get depends very much on the kind of, uh, um, of, of regime that you are in. So you can go from the quasi-static regime, very compact, very dense materials, to a regime which is very loose. And this very loose regime actually are regulated from different constitutive equations. We are quite good in understanding the quasi-static regime. I'm, I, I'm sure that everybody knows about the quasi-static regime, how they behave. In this regime, of course, the shear stress is directly proportional 
to the shear rate. It doesn't, de sorry, doesn't depend on the shear rate. There is the other extreme, which is when the flow is very, very dilute, and uh, the, the momentum is transferred between particles for because of collisions or because of a kinematic transport from one place to the other. Um, there is all the air in between where you see the question mark, which is uh, really what interests us because it's that transition that is really very difficult to quantify. And these are the, the, that is where we are interested in finding the constitutive equations. So this is the area which we, 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 we concentrate on. And uh, as I said, uh, all my interest in this area I don't know. Okay, started because in chemical engineering, and that is a, a circulating fluid ice bed. You can see probably the riser there, and there is a cyclone. And of course, in the circulating fluid ice bed, you have all the regimes that happen. And what we we have done, we have been to apply the constitutive equations that we have available, and to make some uh, um, some modeling. And you can see that there are areas where you have more materials there, which are more dilute, and then all the regimes are there. However, we still don't have a very good way to understand that intermediate regime. So now, what is relevant for this case? If we do a picture about that, that flow which goes down, and this is a dry one from the volcano, so this is really a lahar, the other one is debris, but um, they are very similar in terms of what it's, it's there that you can, uh, um, flow regimes, I mean. And you can see that you can go from uh, frictional enduring contacts up to the transient contact of particle fluid. So you can have a very fluid-like regime and you have a very dense regime and you have that zone in between. And that is, again, what we want to understand. Um, so the challenge really here is to try to, un what we have understood so far in engineering, to transfer it into geology and try to come out with uh, a rule which uh, can help us in uh, making some health and safety assessment and to have something which can help us to 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 anticipate what is going to happen if these flows happen uh, happen now let me go back to this so how do we do this we do it with in two ways we do with um, with a shear cell and uh, i think that most of you know how the shear cell works how many of you know how the shear cell works it's not too bad. Okay, good. Um, and uh, and uh, um, and then we also use an instrument which is which is called FT4. It's a rheometer, and that one is able to give us the understanding of the regime which is not quasi static. Now the guy who produced that one now it, it's Micrometrics because it has been sold. Uh, the company has been sold. Started with uh, a, an engineer that I knew. And it's a family, was a family business. And this son became, after his father was taking this, and he was convincing me to buy this instrument. And I said, I don't want it. I mean, this is, a, this is not a rheometer. This is, this, this is just something which is good for people who need to understand uh, uh, if uh, something flows or not flows. I want to understand constitutive equations. This is not of any good to me. And he said, but please buy it. I'm sure that you are going to like it. Okay, we bought it. We bought it. Well, actually, it became very useful. Um, we, we bought it, and we tried to see if we could really use it for, for our purposes. And I will show you later on that actually we can use it for our purposes, and I'll show you some results. Um, so um, if people know about this flowability measurements granular materials, this is relatively easy. So this is, like I said, this is the classical shear cell experiments. With the shear cell, we measure the, the flow behavior of, of uh, powder applying the normal stress and measuring the shear. Uh, we can uh, understand information about uh, how the wall friction works. And that's important because, of course, I mean, there is a friction with the, with the, with the soil, well, with the bottom, at the bottom of the slide, and uh, compressibility. Uh, and also, the, uh, you can see the different... Um, the different uh, um, uh, kind of materials that we, we uh, analyze. So we go from uh, that side uh, to, that side actually comes from Mexico, uh, our collaborators are in Mexico. It's from a volcano, different kind of volcano. 
uh, the T118 or one and the uh, SI pole, they come both from that quarry in, in, in Italy. Now, um, we have different size of samples. And uh, um, well, I'm an engineer. I'm, I, I used to plot uh, mass distribution, whatever you want to call it, versus size. My student once presented me a size distribution, which was this one. And I said, but this powder behave very strangely because the large ones on the right are just behaving in the way I don't want them to behave. They behave like the fine ones. I said, no, 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 the one on the right are the fine ones. And I said, sorry. Oh, the, we plot them like uh, log in base two of the size. So that that one is, 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 this is apparently what in volcanology do, which is so counterintuitive. And, and I'm happy that people look very uh, strange here as well, because it's not just me, isn't it? I mean, so this is what they do. So I said, okay, if you want to graduate with me, the first thing that you have to do, you have to do everything. And she did it, but I'll show you how she did it. Anyway, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway. Ooh on the stadium, on the, on the stadium, the stage. Anyway, so um, as you can see, in fact, this is very, very confusing because the one with two phi are actually the larger one. And as you increase, they become smaller and smaller. But keep this in mind, that will help you to understand what's going on later on. Um, so we do the usual um, uh, shear test. Uh, which which uh, is a conditioning cycle, of course, uh, and uh, we apply different, we condition the samples, we apply different kind of um, um, uh, normal pressure, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we do the pre-shear to condition the samples, and then we measure what is the shear stress that develop after we apply this, 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 this normal stress. And what we can do with that, so that is how the, 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 uh, we do the experiment. So we condition, and then we apply another normal stress. Uh, we shear up to when uh, this, the, the, this, the sort of straight line that you see there, that is when the, actually the material start to flow, and then you stop. And that's the first point that goes on the yield locus. Uh, and represents what is the shear stress versus the shear, the shear, the shear rate. And then we can, uh, uh, the normal stress, and then we can plot all the points, the locus. And then uh, with that one, we can uh, draw the two circles, the more circles, one which, is, uh, which gives me the um, major principal axis, the largest one, the one which is tangent to the last point before it starts to flow. And the other one, the small one, I don't know if you can see, small one there, which is the unconfined yield stress. In other words, it's the one which makes the, the, the material to flow when it's uh, free. So how it flows freely. So that's, that's the two. And these two points are extremely important. So we can measure with this instrument, with the shear cell, we have uh, the cohesion, which is the interception there. We have the angle of internal friction. We have uh, the major principal stress. We have the unconfined yield stress. And then we can do the flowability function. The flowability function which is the relation between the, the major principal stress and the unconfined uh, stress. Okay, oops. And now we have some results here. So uh, as I said, we start very from uh, large on the left, um, uh, smaller on the right. And if we take this uh, dacite, which comes from Mexico, you can see that usually as um, the, she the, 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 the shear stress increases, 
uh, when the normal stress increases. And the more you increase that, the more you, you have the shear, stress in, the shear stress increase. And you see that the last one, there is actually, when you go to the last five points, which are for the highest normal stress, you get the jump because you have more resistance to be, to be sheared, okay? Like you expect. Um, that side follows beautiful this. When we go to the two samples from Naples, same behavior, despite they are larger particles. So the smaller part, the small ones, we understand that it's probably the cohesion between the particles that gives that kind of behavior. But for that kind of materials from Naples, we don't understand why. And we start to speculate what is going to happen. Well, in practice, this, the samples from, from uh, Mexico is very, is very um, um, hard. The, the, the one from Naples is very friable. So when you shear it, you actually break the samples. Hence, you have many, uh, many little particles that make the samples cohesive, more cohesive. And that's an important result because of course, I mean, when you have now the landslides and when you have, uh, you have to understand what's going on, it's probably what you can predict in Naples is different from what you can predict in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Mexico. Um, we also were able to find out what is the flowability results. And uh, in that flowability results, what we, we are understanding is that if you go with a, a, a flowability function greater than 10 in, in the area down that 10 slope there, uh, this is free flowing. If you go higher, you, you go with... Uh, easy flowing. And you can see that although the two samples from Naples, which are the blue and the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, gray one, are in that area of uh, at the beginning of easy flowing, like you would expect for that particular size. So what's going on? Uh, of course, I mean, uh, the other test that we did, uh, we did uh, also the, the yes the the, the the wall friction stress same same identical experiment, but now instead of having two materials in contact the same materials in contact you have a, a wall that you want to simulate what is going on 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 the ground, and what we have done we have uh, doped the wall we have attached sandpaper to the wall to understand how the asperity of the terrain can affect the results. So we have done different experiment on that, and they go as you expect to be going. And in other words, we could match the, the grid of the, of the uh, sandpaper with the, the, the size of the particles. And then it's exactly, the, it comes out exactly like you expected. However, when uh, we were now doing the, the, uh, the uh, wall friction angle, you see all that beautiful, um, beautiful point there that seems to be very much uh, in, in agreement with what you would expect. In other words, you go from the smaller to the larger and, and it, it's clear what is going on because of course, I mean, if the, the fact that, P, that you have more friction at the wall is depend because if the asperity are higher, the particles are stopped there. If they are very, if it's very smooth, they can, they, they go home. They don't, cannot, so they sleep more freely. However, when we went to the, to the literature, which is available, the literature pre predicts that one. So we are definitely higher than that. And again, this is due to the fact we believe that this, these samples are crushed. So essentially, when we repeat the experiments, we are not the same kind of, of particles before. But again, this is an important result because in real life, you, they undergo different stress. So it's something that we, we, we have to be aware of. So these are some of our results. And now quickly, I don't have much time, but I want to go to this rheometer. Now, if the, our rheom, this rheometer was great, uh, but it has an impeller, which is very, very complicated geometrically. We couldn't say much about that. We could not really do re rheology. It, it is rheometry. It's not rheology. Because we could not predict which kind of flow was, was developing, which kind of relation we could write. So anyway, I had um, 
a student coming from Germany to do a master with me. And then he said, Raffaella, but why don't we do something different? Let's change that impeller. Let's do our own impeller. So we took examples from the shear cell. We, we did that one and they said, but we buy and if we have to ask the, the, uh, the, the technicians to do the workshop, this is going to be forever. Nobody he said, no, no, 3D printing. How much? Five quid. Okay, I'll give you five quid, go and buy it, do it. So anyway, he did it. And uh, what we did, we, we discovered, there is a nice paper about that. We discovered that actually there is a similarity that unfortunately I cannot go into the details where of course you relate the shear stress to the, to the torque and the shear rate to the, the, the angular uh, velocity, but there is a position there where at that particular position, all the results do not depend. If you assume that it's a power law, uh, rheologically, all the point, the, 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 um, the results do not depend from by n, the exponent of the power, which is a very important result because at that point it is squared flow. So at that particular position, we know that it's squared flow. So we did all the experiments and then we are sure now that we have a way to link shear stress to shear rate and that is I cannot go into details we check and recheck and we did different geometries of cells and when we do different geometry all collapse in one curve which means that the relationship between shear stress and shear rate is that one it's only one so that's the, the constitutive equation our paper was published during the pandemic so you can go and check the papers everything it's, it's expressed there it's our paper there Anyway, so these are the different ones, and we did, like I said, I can go fast on this. Now, what did we do with our um, investigation of, with, the DASA, with, with the, the samples that we have? As you can see, uh, the, there is a very diff different kind of behavior there. And the most uh, in interesting one, although the DASA behaves very nicely, it's, it's almost quasi static, isn't it? But the for the, uh, unless for the very small side, but when you go to this uh, T118 and uh, SI pole, they behave, they go all over the place. So you can see it goes down and then it goes up and up again. And then you, you do experiments again and you do experiments again and it's always the same story. So what's going on? Well, we think that the dust side has a shear thinning behavior increase the mobility of particles when the shear the, the, when uh, the shear rate increases this is our what we think that probably is happening and uh, in this one probably we have crashed examples and indeed what we did this is the picture from my student to whom I asked to pl plot the weight versus the, the micron. And of course, the, 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 the small microns are on the right and the, the right one are on the left. So, <laughs> so she did the job, but she didn't put the other way around. Anyway, so I'm still confused, but uh, nevertheless, you can see that actually what we did, we repeat all the experiments before and after a test. And indeed, the granulometry changed. So the particles are crushed, and then we get a different kind of sample. So we are not shearing the same samples when we do all the cycles. And uh, so uh, the conclusions are that really the flowability and compressibility of volcanic shards is strongly affected by the, 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 this distribution. Uh, the wall friction increases, and the, there is a very important aspect that we want to investigate. The virtual quadriomet is very good for this kind of volcanic sam samples, and we need to do more investigations. And indeed, uh, we have uh, asked Hannah Menk in our institute to do some uh, um, micro city for us, and we can really see that the size change. So we have all the, the experiments, we are doing more experiments to understand what is going to be before and after we do. So we have more investigation to understand really what is going on in terms of crashing. And I, I, I like to conclude saying, this is my real conclusion actually. It was on the uh, New York Times in 2020. Uh, easy to understand the physics which is behind quantum me uh, mechanics and general relativity, much more difficult to understand what is the physics behind sand. And uh, with this, I thank you for your attention. And of course, I mean, this is not my work, but it's the work of my collaborators. 
and uh, my students and postdocs. So thank you very much. Okay, we we have one or two questions. We can have, yeah. <laughs> Becky, Becky, don't scare me. <laughs> no, just joke. Yeah, in fact, I think that another good way, a good way, a good thing that we should do, it's very difficult as for instance, you can do that way, but I, I was thinking also the quarry itself, because in the, the quarry has been having deposit all over the years and then given by that. So uh, the problem is that the access to the quarry is very difficult. Uh, they are protected in Italy. And uh, my student, before she came to work with me, was working at the um, Osservatorio Vesuviano, which is the place which has under control the Vesuvio area, which is very, it's very active. And uh, she has the access, but she has made two or three trips to Italy and collect what she has collected. It's very difficult, but I think that's a, for, the, for the future, that's a very good point. That's exactly because you can see how it has been uh, changing with uh, the flora. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's oh, no, another question there. Yeah, well, it's time to ah. <laughs> move on. So you can okay. uh, uh, you can ask her after the session. I'll ask you. Oh, yeah. Oh, there is coming up. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you for the nice presentation. <laughs> um, there is coming up a uh, presentation from exhibitor Telly Danisco. So yeah, please stick around. <laughs> thank you. Oh, you can start Sure. Well, hello everyone. For those that are still around, we just want to introduce ourselves and uh, and our company. Uh, we are represent um, Teladyniscom. Uh, we are manufacturer of. Uh, syringe pumps, uh, as well as uh, um, reciprocating and uh, um, <clears throat> peristaltic pumps. We've been around for uh, uh, many years, uh, a little over 40 years or so. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, just briefly uh, uh, introduce who we are, what we do, and uh, invite you to stop by uh, and visit us uh, in the booth, uh, exhibitor booth. Uh, we uh, recently changed the um, pump family We've um, converted to a new Surrey Access family of pumps, uh, and uh, that's basically uh, gave us a chance to improve the design as well as the uh, the standardization of some of the models that uh, we're offering. We've also ex expanded the pump families into, uh, uh, as I said, adding uh, reciprocating pumps as well as the peristaltic pumps. Um, basically, that's what you're seeing is the um, newer version of uh, uh, Ray Access. Um, reciprocating pumps that uh, we are offering. And uh, uh, the advantage of our product, uh, especially in a syringe pump, is the fact that uh, uh, we have, um, uh, we're offering pumps with a tremendous capabilities. We can offer the pump uh, that is able to uh, um, deliver the flow anywhere from uh, 0 0.0 micro mils per minute all the way up to 408 mils per minute. And uh, uh, pressures all the way up to 20,000 PSI. Um, so hopefully that will uh, um, <laughs> trick your mind in, in a way that uh, these pumps can can work for many different applications and research capabilities. Uh, uh, as I said, we also increased the um, types of pumps, uh, reciprocated pumps, as well as the uh, peristaltic pumps. So uh, please um, stop by. We'll, uh, we'll give you more detailed uh, description 
and uh, will will help you select the proper pumps for your uh, applications. Um, my colleague um, ba Bailey, yeah, he's a local representative here, and um, he'll be able to um, help you as well locally. I'm uh, physically uh, not local here, but um, is always open to um, provide uh, help in in any way, form, shape, or fashion. Thank you.